we, we really need to give them the most options we can and be truly brand agnostic. I think having that independent mindset from the get-go uh, was what ultimately led to me making a, a kind of pathway towards uh, starting TXG. Hello and welcome to Starting Small. My name is Cameron Nagel and what you're about to hear is a resilient story to an entrepreneur's journey over the brand that we know and consume today. At Starting Small, I believe that everyone has a story to tell under one philosophy. Everyone starts small. Even these founders have once started where you are, in their parents' kitchen, basement, out of a wagon, and many more. At Starting Small, we discuss the strategies used, the obstacles overcome, and the successes of an entrepreneur's journey. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Starting Small, and make sure to leave a review to let us know how you enjoyed it. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Ian Fraser of TXG. Ian, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure, Cameron. Thanks so much for having me on. Of course. So I'd like to start out with your upbringing. Uh, where did you grow up and what would you say your childhood was like? Um, you know, I had a very typical childhood. Grew up in the west coast of Scotland, uh, just outside Glasgow would be the, the kind of major city that, that most people would know of. Uh, very close to uh, the, the famous Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond uh, in Scotland. So I had a great upbringing, Cameron. Um, my, my kind of brother and I, uh, mom and dad, we were all you know, crazy into sports. We spent most weekends traveling to different kind of football games or um, or kind of eventually golf. But badminton was another sport of mine growing up that I played at a fairly high level. So, yeah, it was it was just a, a very normal, typical uh, upbringing in a very, very small town. So, um, you know, very, very thankful for, for the kind of foundation that, that kind of, you know, gave me uh, for growing up. For sure. Uh, growing up, would you say that you had an entrepreneurial mindset, say like selling products or lemonade stands or anything like that? Yes, 100%. You know, at the time, you know, and probably hear this from everyone is, you know, I didn't know that that's what it was, but uh, yeah, everything was entrepreneurial in my mind. It was, mm. it was uh, washing cars in the summertime. It was, it was mowing lawns. It was, I actually used to carry, so in, in, uh, in high school, I made, uh, I made a game, um, so I had three dice that I used to carry in my pocket and it was, uh, you know, different kind of every, every kind of different, uh, you know, the different sort of formation of the dice you would, you'd win money. So it was like, it, I used to charge people to play this game effective, yeah. like a gambling machine. And, um, and, and, you know, they would win a little bit of money. I would make a little bit of money, but it was always, always this game of trying to make a little bit and make a little mm. bit. And then, um, Kind of a little bit later, uh, my dad started his own company. He's a, a general contractor back in Scotland, and kind of seen him grow that company. He took it over from his uh, father. There was a four-person company that turned into be a thirty-five-person company. So mm. you know he grew that, and you know, and kind of seeing kind of his uh, entrepreneurial spirit, I definitely think uh, in the background because it was definitely not a conscious thing. It was very much a subconscious. Uh, you know, absorbing all that entrepreneurial spirit, but uh, yeah. you know, all roads, I guess, led to to what we do now at TXG. Amazing, yeah. I would like to get into that. Uh, where where do you get introduced to golf? Is it like family? Is it in your childhood years? And then do you end up going to school uh, to play golf as well, competitive? Yeah, so it was it was actually a little bit later. So I, I took up golf pretty late, relatively speaking. Uh, I was sixteen when I first started playing the game. Uh, my dad uh, took me uh, to play with him. It was. It was the first vacation uh, I went on as a, a lone ranger with my parents. My brother had uh, turned 18 and, and he was going to Ibiza with his friends and I was still stuck in the family vacations. <laughs> um, so we went to Portugal and, and my dad and I, uh, he dragged me out to play. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't overly keen. And he said, listen, come and we'll, you know, we'll play nine holes. And if you like it, great. And if, and if you don't, we'll leave after nine holes. So um sure enough i fell in love with the game you know kind of that day to be honest i still remember it very vividly um and when i came back i was you know i was keen to carry on playing and you know when we get back to scotland um and the crazy thing is we grew up actually our holiday home growing up was in st andrews mm, so wow. you know from probably the age of maybe 12 to, to 15 16 we would be we'd spend all summer long in st andrews but i never touched a club <laughs> so I was in the home of golf and it's, you know, as obviously as time turns out, I take this pathway into uh, being, you know, a, a diehard and be very entrenched in the golf industry. Yet I'm in uh, the one place where you wish you could be and 
I had no interest in the game at that point until uh, that vacation with my dad. Wow. So I'm curious then, uh, where do you end up taking uh, kind of your love and your passion for golf that you start to develop here? Uh, do you end up going to school? I know you went to the University of Birmingham. Uh, what did that look like? So that, so Birmingham were, um, so it was through the PGA uh, of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, so uh, I turned pro. Uh, I was actually, so the, as it turns out, I was working for, uh, for my dad and his company uh, one day, aged 18. Um, and I was just working with, with a group of guys one day. And one of the guys, uh, I overheard him say that his friend had just been fired uh, from his role as an assistant golf pro at our local club. Mm. So uh, when I heard that, I remember grabbing my phone, phoned my mother, told her, meet me at lunchtime with my golf clothes. I heard the assistant pro just get fired. I'm going to go and ask the pro for his job, basically. And um, yeah. so she comes up, gets me, drives me down to the uh, down to the golf club. I meet with the pro and his wife and I said, listen, I, I know you've got some unfortunate circumstances. You've just uh, had to let your assistant go. I really think, uh, you know, I can help you guys in the shop and uh, I would love to do it. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of where uh, the whole thing started. Wow. That's amazing. So how yeah. long does this period last where you're uh, helping him out at this distance here? Um, and how long does that go until you, is this all through grade school? Yeah. So this was, uh, so 18, I'd, I'd left high school. Uh, at the time I, I was, I was kind of, you know, started playing golf at 16, turned mm -hmm. professional when I was 18. But I really, you know, I got went basically from a, a beginner golfer to a two handicap in about two and a half years um, but it was, I, I was still very new in the game. I, you know, although I'd, I'd learned to play to a high level, I didn't really know that much about golf. So it was, um, a very, very uh, famous amateur golfer in Scotland named Colin Dalgleish that sort of took me under his wing. And he gave me some great advice to say, listen, I think you should rather than pursuing a, a career playing right now, I think you should try to, um, turn professional, you know, treat it like an apprenticeship where you're going to have you know, four years of, of you know, uh, education where you can continue to learn a little bit more about the game and the swing and all the mm. different facets uh, of the game. Uh, and then at the end of that, you'll know which direction you want to go. And, and that's exactly what I did. So four years of, uh, of, of going through the training program, um, as you said, distance learning with the Birmingham, uh, Birmingham University um, mm. and playing tournament golf and getting you know, to, to learn how to teach people and learn about golf biomechanics, mm. you know, and all that sort of other stuff, you know, it really, it really done nothing but fuel my fire for golf equipment throughout that process. I, mm. I really, at that time when I was at the PGA, I, I noticed that no one else really was focused on equipment. No one really had a passion for what clubs, what shafts people were using. Yeah. This was in the very early days of launch monitors. And I was very curious about that type of thing. And it didn't seem like anyone else was, um, so it seemed like a really, uh, you know, nice opportunity to, to move in a direction that there wasn't going to be much competition in. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm curious about this transition here. Uh, leaving the University of Birmingham, did you have any other jobs, maybe in the equipment space uh, prior to TXG as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we we done a little bit of club fitting. The, the pro that uh, I worked for had a, a very successful business in, in golf retail. So um, at the time, it was... You know, in the early 2000s was when aftermarket shafts and golf were really starting to kind of kick in. You know, you started to see the, you know, for those of you that are, are kind of into uh, golf equipment, there was the green Aldola NV shaft. There was the yellow uh, UST Pro 4 shaft. So we, you started to notice players playing these different colored shafts. And it was, it was like, well, I wonder what that one does. And I wonder what this one does. So, you know, it early 2000s the the early days of the internet so i would go on all these websites and kind of learn a little bit about all these shafts and hmm. the early days of golf forums and things like that it was all very very yeah. kind of uh back alley uh information at, at that point but you know i was always really really curious to learn and, and it didn't really seem like there were many others that were like that so in a very quick space of time i kind of gained a reputation locally and also uh, amongst the pga pros that i played golf with Go and see Ian. He's the equipment guy. He knows what that shaft mm. does or what that head does, how the ping compares to the tight list or whatever that may be. So, you know, the, the early days of trying to gain a competitive advantage through using equipment was, was sort of forged in my mind at that time. Mm. Yeah. So in 2015, that's when TXG uh, evolves. I'm curious, when do you find the passion to transition from what you're doing existing to launching your own uh, fitting mm. company? 
So in 2004, when I started with TaylorMade in 2004, and, and you know, I loved working for them at that time, they were really making waves as the number one company in golf. Uh, they were making phenomenal you know, golf clubs in the, the R500 and R7 and R9 series, really doing great stuff. But it got to a point where I realized that they'd made great clubs in some areas of the game and then others, you know, Titleist might be better or Mizuno might be better mm. in certain things. So I really kind of, I think I was starting to to gain a, a sense of one company is not the best direction for every golfer. You know, yeah. you, you want to, in order to offer the, the right uh, experience for, for people, we, we really need to give them the most options we can and be truly brand agnostic. So mm. I think having that independent mindset from the get go uh, was what ultimately led to me, you know, making a, a kind of pathway towards uh, starting TXG. Mm, for sure. So once you uh, launch, what what does this concept look like? Uh, when you first launched it, is it just you? Do you have any employees or any any help? And then what does the the model look like from here? So it was it was my wife and I, uh, my wife Tracy and I. So we had moved over from Scotland to Canada in 2011 to to uh, work within another startup. I was a part owner of that one. Uh, mm. There was five of us who owned uh, owned that company. We worked there for four years, and then, as you say, 2015, we left that company to start TXG. So um, it was Tracy and I, and and our other uh, you know employee, who's who's my number two and, and closest confidant in the company, uh, Mike. And, uh, you know, we, we sort of built the, the model of TXG and, and what we thought, you know, we needed to do to be successful and different and, you know, offer something that was truly unique in the space. Um, I think a big part of that at the time was, was the uh, desire to have a digital presence, not just a brick and mortar yeah. presence where people could come and, you know, learn from us in person. Yeah. Um, the, the kind of idea that we would leave a, a bigger legacy and, and, and have, more of an impact in the game was was going to be through social media and digital media. And that's when we launched the, the YouTube channel in late 2017. Amazing. I'm curious, uh, with especially launching on socials and your marketing, can you find a specific demographic that you might find that's attracted to TXG or is it pretty wide range? What would you say? It level is, of golf? It, yeah, it's a wide range. I mean, I think it just comes down to uh, any golfer who's curious enough to try to improve. You know, we, uh, we know the power of social media, digital media, YouTube specifically as the second largest search engine in the world that people will go and, and try and find solutions to their problems within that. I felt that we had built something special in, in 2015 and 16 and, and we were truly doing something unique. But the hard thing was how do we share that with people? How do we get people to understand that what we are doing is unique? So mm. rather than tell people what we do, we decided to use the channel to show people what we do and then ultimately let them decide whether they, they thought that what we were doing was, um, you know, the merit was in it for them to come and, and come and visit with us. For sure. So you have the uh, virtual experience uh, digitally. I'm curious for the listeners out there, can you explain like what's that POV like if a consumer were to go into the brick and mortar, uh, what could they experience at TXG? So okay, you're going to come in and experience a, a baseline test with your own clubs. We're going to get to know the DNA of the golfer. We're going to know how, uh, we're going to try and figure out how well their clubs are suited to them. Then we're going to kind of write up a, a, a prescription for what we think improvement needs to look like, whether that's longer clubs or lighter, different grips, heads, whatever it might be. Could be a golf ball change. Um, and we're, we're going to lay up a, a, a pathway to, to making those changes to help them obviously play better golf. And, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is help people enjoy the game a little bit more. The last thing we want is them being frustrated by, you know, a constant slice or a hook mm. or you know, the clubs feeling like they're too heavy to the point where they get fatigued late in the round. So, you know, we're truly customizing the, the golf clubs to give the golfer the best experience when they play the game. And, and I think that's ultimately one of the ways we differentiated ourselves. We were not just concerned about what was going on in the Bay and getting the numbers better in the, in the moment. Yeah, You know, having the mindset of the customer's going to leave with these clubs and they're going to take them to their club and they actually have to start shooting lower scores or the thing is going to be, or the whole process is going to be a failure. Yeah. So, you know, our, our kind of role and, and our, our philosophy was to go, how do we take that customer or how do we, how do we follow that customer on the journey with these golf clubs? How do we continue to be part of that process? And through technology now, such as Arcos, where we can give the golfer, um, you know, 14 sensors on the golf club, 
It allows them to gather data metrics on their scores, how many greens they hit, how many fairways they hit, how far they're hitting each club. We can be preemptive to any problems that they have in their game um, mm. without them having to reach out and tell us that they're struggling with a three-wood or a drive or whatever it might be. We yeah. can literally see it in their metrics on their, their user dashboard so wow. that we can literally be with them on every round that they play. And if we see that there might be a, a problem with a seven iron or a single club or a set of clubs, we can then get them back in, do a follow-up, make sure that what we diagnosed the first time is the same as what we're, we're looking at now. And then that's truly, you know, the, the tour experience because that's what tour players get every week in the PGA Tour. That's amazing. That I'm curious, the technology that goes behind this, was this developed by like your R&D team or did you bring in this technology from a third party? What did this look like? This is phenomenal. Yeah, so this was by a third party. Arcos uh, was started by a, a, a phenomenal um, uh, entrepreneur, uh, Sal Said. Uh, Arcos, he's he's become a good friend and and somebody I greatly admire for his his desire to connect the community of golfers mm. um, and 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 share the 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 best information that really only only the the PGA Tour players had access to. And you know, I think that's where all of us are trying to strive for is is to give the you know the common golfer the weekend warrior the the chance to get more um, information about their golf game that's ultimately going to help them improve. Mm-hmm. I mean, you see these golfers now in the teams of nutritionists and biomechanists and swing coaches and all that sort of stuff, and we're trying to surround our clients with you know as much of those services as we possibly can and make it accessible with uh, with our stores. For sure. Well, I, I like to conclude each episode with this, uh, with your time uh, and your ventures. If you could share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, maybe something you've learned or regret, uh, what would you say that would be? In terms of regrets, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, you've probably heard this a million times from entrepreneurs, uh, Cameron, but I really don't think you can live with regrets. You know, you make the best decision with the information you have at that time and and being decisive is much, much better than not making a decision at all. So, um, you know, I I don't think I have, I don't think I have any regrets because as I say, I made those, those, those informed decisions with the best information I had at the time. In terms of advice, uh, one thing I've always, always followed is, um, you know, People overestimate what they can achieve in in a year and they underestimate what they can achieve in, you know, five to 10 years. And Mm. that's something that has been true to, you know, to me, my whole golf career, whether that's my advancement as a playing professional, when I tried to play the game for a living, I wanted to get better so fast either, you know, it wasn't happening fast enough. But when I look back at it and went, wow, you went from a beginner to a two handicap in two and a half years that was pretty amazing. But at the time I was frustrated that it wasn't going fast enough for me. Mm. You know, I look at TXG as a business and I wanted to be, you know, I wanted TXG to be taken over the whole globe, yeah. you know, by, by this time, you know, but here we are, we've got two stores, you know, and, and we're growing into other regions in Canada. But when I look back at it now and the global reach of the brand now is, is, is great and it's fantastic. And people know about TXG all over the world. Um, and, and that's fantastic. We've managed that in six years, but you know, part of me also says that we've not we've not grown enough. So, mm. you know, I think having that balance of never be too hard on yourself as well. But you know, given time, you know, the 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 business will blossom uh, nicely. Absolutely. Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining me, and to the listeners out there, make sure to check out TXG at txg.ca.